Well, to cosmologists, the Big Bang Theory is the idea that the universe was once smaller, hotter, and denser than it is today, and that it's been expanding and cooling and growing less dense over the last 13.8 billion years. To the public, um, the Big Bang Theory means that the universe had a beginning uh, that we call the Big Bang. And many people describe it as an explosion, although that's not really the right idea. It's really an extrapolation beyond what we have evidence for. It's a guess for what happened, what happened uh, uh, at the beginning. And we're not sure about it. And it's not clear that, there, we, that it's the right idea. Well, if the universe did have a beginning, like the Big Bang, coming out of the Big Bang, the distribution of matter and energy would be very irregular, wildly distributed, and space and time would be curvy and twisted and warped. But when we actually look at the universe today, we see none of that. The distribution of matter and energy is very nearly uniform throughout the universe, and space itself is extremely flat, obeying the laws of simple geometry. So how did we get from that wild Big Bang beginning to the present? That's where the idea of inflation came in. The idea was, after the bang, perhaps there was a period of very, very rapid, accelerated expansion, stretching the universe so fast that it would make it smooth and flat, and the distribution of matter and energy would be smoothed out in this way. So that was, that was the concept of introducing inflation. Well, the first time I heard about inflation was uh, in the very earliest days, one of the first talks given on the subject by Alan Guth. He had a, this general idea that this stretching might help solve some problems in cosmology. But he had a problem too, which was that once inflation started, he couldn't figure out how to make it end and how we'd ever form galaxies and stars like we observe in the universe. Uh, so that got me started <clears throat> in the field. Uh, trying to see if I could f get around the problem that uh, Alan Guth had and see if I could find a way of getting inflation to end because it seemed like such an exciting idea. I j just shouldn't die. There should be some way to save it. And fortunately, working with my student Andy Albrecht and then independently Andre Linde in the Soviet Union, uh, we discovered a workaway, a, a workaround, a way of having the inflation but also having it end. There are alternatives to inflation. In fact, I myself, along with my collaborators, have been exploring an idea, a very different idea, over the last decade, mainly because the inflation idea itself has its own problems. And in order to solve, and so it doesn't really accomplish the, the feat that uh, we, was originally, we thought it originally could to make the universe as smooth and as flat as needed. So we've been thinking the idea of the idea of getting rid of the Big Bang and replacing with what we call a bounce. And a bounce would mean the universe would go through a period of contraction, and at a certain point, when it got small but not too small, it would reverse itself from contraction to expansion. And during this contraction, it turns out, you can ultra-smooth and flatten the universe. So you didn't need inflation. After the bounce, it would already have all the properties that you wanted it to have. So we call this the uh, bouncing cosmology, or sometimes the big bounce theory. So for cosmology, I think we're at a very exciting moment because we have a lot of data coming in that gives us information about the evolution of the universe at various stages that will help us decide between the big bang idea the Big Bang plus inflation idea, and the bouncing idea. So for example, there are experiments uh, being built in the mountains of Chile, and there are other sites at Antarctica and around the world uh, trying to trace after the information that will help us decide which of these ideas is correct. <clears throat> Whichever one it is correct will have an important influence in our thinking about high energy physics. How does gravity fit into the story? because they have very different pictures about how gravity works 
over time, especially when you have very high energies, very high temperatures, and very high densities, as you would have near a bang or near a bounce. They give us very different pictures, and by studying cosmology, we can actually learn something about this important part of high energy physics. Quasicrystals are a novel form of matter that we, for hundreds of years we thought was impossible. We thought the only way that atoms could arrange themselves in an orderly arrangement inside matter was to form a crystal. And a crystal is a, uh, a form of material in which the atoms pack together like building blocks in a children's toy, just one after the other after the other with equal spacings. And if that was the only form of matter that was possible in which you have an orderly arrangement. You can also show that it can only have certain symmetries, certain facets. And until the 1980s, in fact, those were all that we saw. The only kinds of uh, matter we knew were, were of crystals or random distributions of atoms called glass. But in the 1980s, my student Dove Levine and I proposed the possibility of a new very different form of matter which could violate those rules of symmetry in which things like atoms and molecules would pack together in a more subtle way but still in a predictive way, still an orderly way in which you might have for example two kinds of atoms or two different kinds of groups of atoms where one repeats with one period or one frequency and the other repeats with a different period or a different frequency where they where these two frequencies have a ratio which is an irrational number. So the entire pattern actually never repeats, even though each of the individual pieces that compose it do repeat at a regular rate. And this is called quasi-periodic by mathematicians and led to the idea of quasi-crystals. At first this idea was simply a hypothetical idea, but around the same time that we were finishing up our theory, a group in the U.S accidentally discovered a material which violated the laws of crystallography. And it turned out to be the first example of a quasi-crystal. And then what I was talking about in my lecture here was, a, was uh, an, an adventure that occurred almost 20 years later, or began 20 years later, when we began, we, when we began to ask the question, are there any quasi-crystals that might be in nature that we may have missed? because after all, the first crystals humans came across were in nature, not made in the laboratory. After 10 years of a long investigation, including a very bizarre detective story, we in fact found such an example. And that example turned out to be formed in a meteor that formed at the very beginning of the solar system, before there was even an Earth. In other words, up to this point, we thought that the oldest quasi-crystals had been made in the laboratory sometime in the 1980s. We discovered that nature had figured it out four and a half billion years earlier, even before our planet existed.